My name is Jason, and I did work at Southwest. It's a great place to work. I, uh, I started there in 1990, uh, 1988 and went to 1998. And uh, just to give you a brief resume, I was manager of customer service training for four years. That is an absolutely fantastic job. If you get a chance to take manager of customer service training at Southwest, you should do it. But then I got the idea that I could do what you guys do. I thought I could manage people, facilities, and resources. So I became manager of customer service for Los Angeles International Airport. That is a terrible job. Do not take that job. Uh, and I happened to go there in my youthful wisdom in 1992-93. Remember what happened in LA in 92-93? Three big national events that distracted us from our service. Or tried to, anyway. You remember what happened in LA, 92-93? Big events. We had, the, we had the Northridge earthquake. Uh, I was born and raised in Dallas, Texas. Concrete doesn't do this where I come from. <laughs> what else happened? No, not the Olympics. No? Rodney King verdict came back. Some of that riot activity spilled right into the airport. We shut Terminal 1 down for a while. It was a mess. And the biggest distraction of all was who? OJ. Everybody forgets about that. It's impossible to get employees out of the break room where they're watching the Bronco go down the 405. <laughs> Dude, the Bronco, go to the ticket counter. What I found out that year is I'm not an airport manager. I am a people developer. And I transferred back into our leadership development center where we did programs just like this. So I'm going to come at you pretty fast today with some stuff that I think is true. Um, and if you apply truth, you get results. Would you agree? And there's going to be some real practical, tactical things that you can pull out of this that I hope you take back and use. Uh, in an hour and a half, uh, there's no way I could cover the expanse of Southwest Airlines. But I can give you some ideas and thoughts. But let me start with this. Let me get my prop over here. Um, culture is a, a big deal to me. As a matter of fact, I've written a couple of books on it. The latest one is The Culturetopia Effect. Uh, Culturetopia is my way of expressing this uh, ideal state of high performance and high fulfillment. Right? Personally, professionally, emotionally, relationally, uh, we create this space where there's high performance, high fulfillment. If I were to make a big quadrant up here, and uh, this uh, horizontal axis is here, the vertical, uh, vertical and then horizontal, the upper right-hand quadrant would represent Culturetopia. That's a place where there's high performance and high fulfillment. What are the attitudes and behaviors of people who have high performance and high fulfillment? This is going to be interactive, by the way. So, High performance, high fulfillment, what are the attitudes and behaviors of those people? They're engaged, they're motivated, high energy, deliberate, positive, inspirational, motivational. Usually you like to work around those kinds of people. High performance, high fulfillment. The problem with this is that there's high performance, high fulfillment, which is what we try to create at Southwest, there's a potential for high performance, low fulfillment. So this other left-hand side over here, high performance, low fulfillment. What are the attitudes and behaviors of that person? Yeah, they're, t they're tired. Sometimes they get burned out. They get really frustrated. They're still doing the work, but they're frustrated. Somebody pushed their fairness button, and they're not happy anymore. They should be in HR because they're really good recruiters. Come to the dark side, right? <laughs> we have to work diligently to keep people over in high performance, high fulfillment. If we're going to create this culture of respect, this culture of care, culture of accountability, uh, and the byproduct of all that is great customer service. Now, if I stay in high performance, low fulfillment long enough, I slide down to low performance, low fulfillment. What are the attitudes and behaviors of that person? Late wine complaints, sabotage, steal. That's all before noon, right? <laughs> Dangerous place to be here. Right? Now, be careful with Low, uh, low performance, high fulfillment. That, that's a, the, the fourth quadrant over here. Yeah, that's right. It could be your new hire. They're just ignorance on fire. Yeah, I got the job, All right? If you've been there 30 years and you're performing at a low level and you're very satisfied with that, that person has quit and stayed. <laughs> that's... So we either have to get them re-engaged or help them finish the quitting process, right? All right, so this presentation, the Southwest Effect, I'm going to share some history of Southwest. At any point, if there's a question that pops into your mind and we want to spend some time on that, I'm fine with that. Uh, if it's unproductive for the whole group, I might take the facilitator's right to redirect. But in an hour and a half, it's going to have to move pretty quick. Are you ready? Okay. All right, so there's the tail wing there. With permission, I gladly... Uh, show that. Oh, by the way, when I left Los Angeles, I went back into our Leadership Development Center. Uh, I mentioned that. Uh, my main role there was to research, design, and deliver system-wide customer service programs. Uh, so I'm going to be coming from that foundation uh, this morning. All right, so the emergence of Southwest. Let's just get a little background of, of Southwest. Some of you may or may not know uh, much about them. Uh, consumers, particularly corporate travel departments, this is back when we had all those big corporate travel departments, uh, became very price sensitive. 
right? in the 80s. So all of a sudden, the shift over to these low-cost carriers became very important. Southwest was designed from the very beginning not to compete with other airlines. It was designed to compete with the bus. On these long trips in these Texas highways, they said, let's get out of the bus, get out of the car. We want to make it cheap enough to fly. Uh, and for the first time, the traveling public had an option. And they could get on a plane, and they could get to Dallas or San Antonio or Houston, the first three cities they flew to. Uh, so it's a blue ocean strategy. If you've ever read that book, it's, a, it, it's not even trying to compete in the red ocean of cutthroat competition. It's getting out of that and saying, let's make it irrelevant. Let's make the competition irrelevant. Consumers began to redefine quality in terms of reliability, right? You want, to, you want to get there, you want to be safe. Obviously, you don't have to say that in aviation. Be careful coming up here. Be no, I'm just kidding. Come on up. <laughs> okay. All right? You want your bags to show up. And so Southwest began to start putting emphasis on the things that really matter to the customer. A lot of carriers do a great job doing stuff that no one really cares about, and they don't do as well as stuff they really do care about. And so we have to redefine what is it from the customer's perspective that they really want, and then let's get really good at that. All right. After 20 years, Southwest, this was a huge move. They, they just invaded the West Coast uh, and really took a lot of markets away from the major carriers. And it was a huge move, and it really set the stage for them uh, to become nationwide. And even during the Gulf War, Southwest expanded while other companies shrank. I was manager of customer service in 1991 when the Gulf War broke out. Um, my counterparts at the other carriers got furloughed like that. Herb Kelleher, who was the CEO, president, chairman of the board at the time, he called a meeting of all the employee training, uh, training departments and all the employee events committees. And he said, we're going to have more parties and we're going to do more training this year than we've ever done. In a time where, you know, everybody else is furloughing their training departments, my budget for customer service training got doubled. Southwest made $26 million in 1991. The industry lost billions, right? The profit margin for that $26 million was 0.7 customers per flight. You think it was a good idea to focus on training customer service? You bet it was. It's a huge investment, and so many people, they don't invest at the right time with the right thing. All right, so we want to be thinking, how do I, how do I invest for the sake of the customer? And right, that's what we want to be doing. All right, let's keep going. The Department of Transportation just defined it like this. They said, Southwest is having a profound effect. Let me come over here so you guys can see. A profound effect in the airline industry. They're much lower operating cost. Um, it makes it dominant in the airline today. Uh, other airlines can't compete. I'll just give you a, a, a hint of what that looks like. Now, this is pre-bankruptcy and pre-merger uh, for American Airlines. For every airplane that American Airlines has, they have twice as many employees as for every airplane that Southwest has. So if you just look at physical equipment to staffing, they have twice as much staffing, or twice as much headcount, twice as much employee cost. Right? The average Southwest jet sits on the ground, touchdown, bags off, people off, freight off, bags on, people on, freight on. It sits, sits on the ground about 18 to 25 minutes. The average American jet, about an hour. Now, if you had a cab company, and you had to pay two drivers, and they had to wait in the cab line an hour, and they're competing against a company that waited 18 minutes and paid one driver. Who's going to, I mean, it's apples and oranges. So how do you get that productive? You got to create an environment where people want to be high performance, high fulfillment. You got to meet needs and employees that aren't being met anywhere else. And in turn, they meet needs and customers that aren't being met anywhere else. And that's where the relationship comes and that's where the trust comes. And I, I, I think we're in very similar businesses because people have to put a lot of trust in you, right? To do business with you. Uh, it, it, same thing to aviation. We get to take their stuff from them. We get to take their bags, and they willingly give it to us. <laughs> it takes a lot of trust. Uh, they're going to get on a plane and hope that we're flying them to the right place. <laughs> it takes a lot of trust, not to mention the safety aspects of it. So uh, this idea of relational uh, coordination and trust, very important. I'll talk more about that in the keynote later.